So welcome again uh, to chapter or to the third session of our, uh, our, our course, um, Automation of Robotics. And uh, for this session today, we will begin the, the concept of uh, kinematics. This will not be a tutorial or a lecture style uh, a course or a, you know, a session. This will be a tutorial hands-on. Uh, we will go through some theory, some concepts, and then we will then we will have the chance to perform some exercises. As I discussed in the group before earlier today, the, you will be required to perform the task, do the work at, on hand or on paper and, and, and at your own place, and then take a picture and then send your solution or your work to me into the Telegram group. I don't care if your work is success is correct or not. That is not the point. The point here is that you try. Try is better than watching. Try and fail is still better than watching. Try and fail and later on learn your mistake is exactly how you will learn this topic. Without jumping into the pool and attempting to swim and drowning for a while, you will never learn to swim. If you stay on the stand watching people swim and you never try it for yourself, you will never ever pick it up. That's why is the concept of uh, trying. So let's talk about kinematics. So the first part about kinematics, or the first concept of kinematics that we discussed today, is the concept of the frame matrix. Uh, yeah, here we go. We need to discuss what is the frame matrix. Oh, by the way, also, I discussed, uh, last week I asked you to, to do some refreshes on matrix operations and also on trigonometry. Unfortunately, for the lack of time or for the limited time, I won't have time to go through these concepts myself. I provided you with the references on Moodle, so you can uh, prepare or you can uh, go back and, uh, and refresh your, your knowledge. But don't worry, today, or for this session today, we won't do much matrix operation. It will be simple vector analysis and vector calculations. The, the matrix operations will begin most likely uh, next session. I hope so, I have to double check. Okay, so uh, what are we gonna talk about today? So we're gonna talk about uh, kinematics. What is it all about? And then robot kinematics, what is it all about? We're gonna, then we're gonna introduce the concept of the frame matrix and how is it used to, uh, and how is it used uh, for, what is it, what's the relationship between it and robotics? Uh, by the way, I'm receiving messages from people saying that they have network issues that cannot join me. Uh, can, can I join the live session? Uh, well, this is recorded, and you can, I will post the recording of this later on uh, into our Teams page as well as the YouTube channel. So uh, if you could not catch the session live with me, and therefore you could not catch the hands-on, uh, it's your responsibility when you watch the recording of this is to also perform the hands-on exercises. Maybe you will not be uh, live with me, but again, you will have, the, you will have to have to go through this yourself. Also, if you're doing this again on your own time, once again, try, it's your responsibility to try and uh, do the exercises and not just watch me do the solutions for you. Okay, let's return to the, con to the content. So kinematics, what is it all about? Robot kinematics, what is it all about? Inverse and forward. Then we're gonna discuss or introduce the concept of the frame matrix and how is it uh, relevant to robotics? Then uh, we need to talk about uh, the properties of the frame matrix, which is also important because before we can do um, uh, kinematics or robotic kinematics or work with matrix operations, we need to learn more about the frame matrix and its features because it's unique. I know that you have an idea of what is a matrix from previous courses and previous knowledge in school or in previous courses in engineering, but the frame matrix, as you will learn today, is slightly different and it has special features. And that is what is this section right here is all about. Um, let me uh, show you the point. So yeah, so uh, introduction, uh, what is the frame matrix? And then finally the properties. So let's keep going. So um, the first things first is that what is kinematics in general? Um, Kinematics in general, uh, you have heard this term before, whether it's statics or theory of machine or dynamics or even physics at school. It's obviously describes the motion of points, bodies, and objects, and discusses their position, velocities, and accelerations. 
without considering the forces that cause these motions. Once again, when we say the word kinematics, we are referring to position, velocities, and accelerations, but we are ignoring the forces that cause this motion to happen. And this is exactly the same thing with robot kinematics. We will be focusing on position and velocities and acceleration. Uh, I'll tell you, it's going to be 99% or 90% position only. Velocity and the velocities and acceleration will be uh, very briefly discussed, and I'll explain the reasoning for this. Why is this later? You will see that the hard work is the position analysis. Once you get that done, then upgrading it or expanding it to include velocities and acceleration will be uh, a repetitive work and relatively easier. So if that was general kinematics, what is then robot kinematics? So robot kinematics is Let's take a look at this example in this robot right here. This robot is a four degree of freedom robot. Um, um, hold on for a second, guys. Yeah, just uh, one, uh, one second. Yeah, so apologies for that. So now, uh, can somebody tell me, by the way, what is the name of this robot? We have seen it before. Can somebody remember the name of this robot? No? Can you all hear me? <laughs> yes, sir, but we can't remember what's the name of the thing. Oh, you no say, don't remember, sir. <laughs> Okay, well, this yeah, robot is called the Skara robot. <laughs> uh, you know, those, uh, those slides that I gave you before about foundation and all of that stuff, uh, it was not uh, for fun. It was for you to work on. So this is actually the Skara robot. And uh, it was something that we've seen before with a very weird uh, uh, work and book. But anyway, let's get back to the point. So this robot is four degrees of freedom robot. Uh, it has three angular joints, three rotations, and one linear. And uh, these individual joints, theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, and L4, L is the length here, yeah. Um, we can then uh, describe or we can set the pose of the end effector. You might not be familiar with the word pose, but uh, pose actually simply means position and orientation. Position and orientation. Uh, from now on, we're going to refer to it as the pose. So uh, rather than keep saying position and orientation, position every time, so we're just going to say pose. So the word pose simply means uh, position and orientation of the end effector. So by simply controlling the angles or the joint and or the robot joints, theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, and L4, we can indirectly control the pose of the end effector. Uh, okay, let's move on to the next one. Now, robot kinematics focuses on the relationship between the movements of the robot joints and the pose of the end effector. How are they related? What is the direct, what is the actual relationship between them? Uh, for example, here's forward kinematics. Uh, before we get to that, um, it's not just about understanding the relationship, but it's about developing that relationship. We will, you will need to develop a set of equations or formulas or models that can directly give us the relationship between them. Meaning, if you know the values of, let's say, the robot joints, then you will identify the position or the, or the pose of the end effect and vice versa. And that is exactly what is forward kinematics. If you are giving the movements of the robot joints, let's say this other example now, if we know the values of theta one and theta two and theta three, then we can directly and exactly determine the value or the position and orientation of the, of the, of the end effect. Let's say this is the point right here. Meaning, if I take the actual values of theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, and plug them into a formula, I will exactly get x and y coordinates. So this is forward kinematics. I want you to put this note somewhere in your mind, because the concepts of forward kinematics will be with us for the next five weeks. Um, basically, kinematics is divided into two parts. The first part is right here, which is forward. Hopefully, by now you can guess what is inverse. It's quite obviously, uh, this is an example of forward. 
If I give you the values of theta one, theta two, and theta three, as you can see here, then we will need to calculate and find exactly the corresponding values of x and y of the ND factor. This procedure is called forward kinematics. Inverse kinematics, as you may have guessed, is the inverse or the reverse of this process. If you are given the pose of the end effector, then what will be the corresponding values of the joint values? Meaning, if you already know firsthand how much is the, the coordinates here, let's see, if I give you right now the values of x equal to 5 and y equal to 3, right? What will, what will be the corresponding values of theta 1, theta 2? So this is now inverse kinematics. And we will work on both of these two kinematics throughout the next five weeks. And the procedure of working with kinematics is to develop uh, those equations. And why is this equation, in, why are they important? Because we are going to use these equations later on when we program and control the robot. Once we have those formulas available with us, then we will then uh, be able to develop the models and the algorithms or the, you know, the formula that will help us control the program, the, the robot. So in order to solve these two problems, which is forward and inverse kinematics, we will use a variety of approaches and not just matrix operations. We will also use trigonometry, algebra, and don't panic here, differential equations. Although the word differential equations might freak you out, but the one we're going to use is extremely simple. So it's very, very basic, something that you have already worked with and familiar with. Okay, up to this point, any questions? I know it's a theory so far, but uh, that's how we're going to be working. Theory for a while, then uh, hands on for a while. Any questions? Okay, so let's move on. So before we get to the frame matrix, let's talk about a few foundational stuff. So in a two-dimensional world, if I want to represent a point in space, then we need to find out its coordinates. I'm sure everybody is familiar with this. You will need to know its x and y coordinates. So if you know the values of x and the value for y, then you will, you will be able to represent it graphically or um, geometric or basically analytically. And the way we represent it graphically is by drawing the line here and the line here. So this vertical line will be PY or position Y, and this horizontal line will be PX. Or we can also represent it in a vector like this. I know you're, you might be familiar with vectors from statics and from theoretic machines, but you may have also been familiar with it in, the, in, in from um, numerical methods when we represent vectors in, as, as the matrices or as columns like this. Is that clear? The same point, we can also represent it in a three-dimensional world or a 3D world by simply adding the Z coordinates. So you will have PX, PY, PZ. You will need the three coordinates. This way, you will be able to represent this point in space. Now, representing our point in space is just a fancy word for saying modeling. We are modeling this point. We are representing it with a mathematical model. This is the mathematical model. The value for X, value for Y, and value for Z, we put it in a vector form. Okay, cool, what's next? Well, this is next. Now, we're gonna add something in the bottom here, something, this is probably maybe something new for you. And we're gonna add something called W. Uh, w here simply represents the weight. And uh, the weight essentially is by default equal to one. So whatever, by default we will put here one. So if it's always one, why do we need it? Well, it's not always one. Uh, we will see later on uh, when or how we change this value. But for now, we will need to put something here and that W will. For now, we're gonna give it a value of one. But the X and Y and Z are very, very similar to what you are familiar with so far. Uh, by the way, uh, at any given time, if you have a question, just unmute yourself and ask a question. If you, uh, I hope you don't message, uh, sorry, in a, don't put your question in the chat group because I might not see it. I suggest that you simply unmute yourself and ask your question. If you're watching in the recording, you can ask me your question in the group or in, uh, in, uh, in, in our chat group or in our Telegram group. Or you can, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can then put me in, a, in your question in the comments. Okay, so let's carry on. Um, okay, so this is now the Victor and plus W. Okay, what's next? Now, this is a point. What about a line? Well, we also learned in the past that to represent a line, you need two points, point one and point two. And therefore, um, in a two-dimensional world, you will need to know the differences between the X and Y coordinates. 
point one will have x one y one and point two will have x two and y two coordinates. Is that right? And therefore, the the line or this line here is defined by delta x and delta y. So delta x could be x two minus x one or x one minus x two. Which one is it? It depends on which direction you want. If you want the arrow to point from P1 to P2, so you go for X2 minus X1. If you want the arrow pointing towards P1, so you go X1 minus X2. I hope, I'm not really teaching anything new. I'm just refreshing concepts that you are, you should be familiar with from previous courses, whether it's physics, mathematics, or calculus, or even uh, statics. The same concept is uh, again expanded to include three dimensional. Uh, delta P, X, P, Y, and Delta P, Z. And again, we add W in the end. W will always be with us from now on, and it's going to be our new best friend. So far, so good. Any questions? Okay, let's move on. Uh, now, there is another way to represent a line in space. And this one we are familiar with. Two points and find the differences between them. We're good to go. Now, there is actually another way to represent a line in space. And that actually involves the length and direction um, or the orientation of the line. The length is obviously the length. We know what that is. It's the actual distance from, from the beginning until the end of the line. So this part is easy. What about the direction here? Well, as you can see here, the direction is represented by something called the directional vector. So in this graph right here, this line here represented by two things. First of all, the direction vector, which is this arrow right here, plus the length. So if you have these two pieces of information, the length or the magnitude of the line plus its directional vector, then you can also represent it in vector form. All you have to do is think of the length as W really. So take the magnitude multiplied by the directional vector, you'll be good to go. You'll be representing the line. So now let's focus our attention on the directional vector uh, right here. And uh, in a two-dimensional world again, the directional vector is always what is called a unity vector. Unity basically means it has a unit length. Unit simply means equal to one. Uh, when we're counting, we count one, two, three, uh, one something, two units, three units, four units. So the unit is actually the is actually equal to one. Um, and its direction is defined. The, how do you okay fine? We know that the length of this uh, unit vector or the directional vector is is equal to one. Okay, thank you. But what about the direction? How do we define it? It's defined by the angle, as you can see here. If you know the value for the angle, then you can know the direction of this arrow. Is that clear? Uh, more specifically, not the angle, but its cosine. Um, why cosine? Why not the sine? Um, that's trigonometry. Let's not focus on that for now. Let's just say that someone made the conscious decision to, to use cosines rather than sine. I just agree on that. And we're going to use the cosine for now. Uh, there is a real uh, geometrical reason, but I don't want to go through it. This is now unique. That the direction of the vector is determined by the cosine of the angle rather than uh, something else. So then, if you have the angle and its cosine, and you know, therefore, this direction. And therefore, it then can be used to determine the direction of the, of the line. So far, so good. Any questions up to this point? No, sir. Uh, if you think I'm going too fast, you can always ask me to slow down. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to assume everything is fine. If my voice is cutting or something like that, please inform me. Uh, your voice is slightly cutting every few seconds. Okay, let me try. Okay, so uh, I hope this is better. Okay, let's keep going. Now, we talked so far about. Um, uh, what is called um, um, directional vector in a two-dimensional world. Let's ex once again expand this concept to include 3D. So in a three-dimensional world, in order to describe um, a direction of a, of, of a vector, we cannot use one angle only. We have to use three angles. Uh, now, before we get to the 3D example, take a look at this angle once again and realize that this angle is basically the angle defined between the line itself and the x-axis. Is that right? 
Now, we don't need another angle here because we know that that will be equal to 90 minus this angle. Is that right? So that is why we only need one angle in a two-dimensional world. Is that clear? Now, when we go to the three-dimensional world, uh, now the situation is different. So in order to describe this, the direction of this vertical, or this vector right here, we cannot use one angle. We have to use three angles. Those are alpha, beta, and gamma. And the definition of alpha, beta, gamma is actually shown right here. Alpha is the angle that is defined between uh, the line itself and the x-axis. And, uh, and beta is the angle defined between the line itself and the y-axis. And gamma is the angle defined between the line itself and the, the z-axis. So in other words, if you have a line in space, in order for you to describe its direction, you will need to have three angles, and more specifically, three cosines. Once again, this is, uh, let's think of it like an agreement. Okay, let's all agree. Okay, this is the concept that uh, in order to describe uh, a line in 3D world, we need three angles. The definition of those angles are right here. That essentially is the angles formed between the line and the corresponding x and y and z axis. And we more specifically need to use their cosines, not their sums. Up to this point, all good? Okay, so what's, okay, so once again, what we're gonna do next is simply rewrite this, but in the matrix form, and here we go. Just like when we described a position earlier on uh, here in X, Y, and Z, this is described as a position, right? We now describe um, essentially the orientation or the direction of this vector right here. By the way, this, um, this uh, the way of writing it here this right here, the U, is a unit vector. That's why it's called U. And this is a directional vector, and this is the magnitude. If you remember a while back, a few slides ago, we'd say the vector is described by the directional vector, which is a unit vector, multiplied by the length. Is that right? Well, that's exactly what is shown here. A unit vector multiplied by the magnitude, which is the length. And this um, notation was used in vectors in the past before. So therefore, if you want to use this directional vector, we will need three angles, alpha, beta, gamma, and w. Is that clear so far? Now, because this is a directional vector, and because we know the magnitude of this vector is unity or equal to one, we cannot put w here. We will have to use w of equal to zero. Once again, sir, why not equal to one? Is equal to one? Well, the, the concept of w is that is, it's a scale, not a, a magnitude. So when the scale is equal to one, does not mean the value of the length is equal to one. It simply means when the scale is one means uh, use whatever length you have. Uh, I'll tell you what that means. Um, let's say, uh, uh, let's, just, let's just define something called um, X. Let's just say X is equal to five. Okay, I'm gonna actually write it down here. So let's just say uh, X is equal to five uh, and scale is equal to one. What does that mean? It means basically that the value for x is going to equal to 5. Uh, what is that? 5 multiplied by 1 equal to 5 again. You got what I mean? So earlier on, when we, uh, when we said that the, that the vector uh, or the magnitude was equal to 1 right here, we meant that we're going to use a scale of equal to 1. OK? doesn't mean that the magnitude is equal to 1. It means that we're going to use a scale of 1. And therefore, uh, whatever value we have here, or whatever magnitude we're going to get from those guys, we're going to use it without changes. Is that clear? So that was for the regular vector, the one with an actual magnitude uh, by itself. Now, for the directional vectors, because we know the directional vector has already a, a unit vector, and therefore it already has a magnitude of length of equal to 1, there is no scale associated with it. And because there is no scale associated with it, there is no need for this guy at all. So how do you remove it? Well, we just put a zero. Zero means no scale. So we're going to use, uh, we're going to ignore the concept of scale. Uh, so if the value of zero, why do we need it? Uh, that will, ex will be explained later. Uh, so if we don't need W, if it's equal to zero, why put it there in the first place? Uh, that also will be shown uh, later. For now, let's just move on with our but with our discussion. Okay, so uh, I think it's time for some exercise.
So uh, let's talk about some, let's begin with our very first exercise. So up to this point, everything we've covered so far was just point and line, nothing else. We discussed the concept of a point in space in a 3D world. We also discussed the concept of a line, and we also discussed how you show the direction of a line using three angles. That's all we said so far. And based on that, let's uh, get busy with this uh, couple of exercises that I have here. So I'm going to give you exactly one minute. Um, yeah, actually less than one minute. We do this exercise. You have a value of x equal to 10 and y equal to y. Plot the vector describing this point in space. It doesn't have to be scale, just a regular drawing, just showing the values. And then write the vector in matrix form describing this point. Basically, what I want you to do is to repeat this. You get what I mean? Giving the value of x and y, uh, write the matrix form and also plot. If the value does not include z, then you can ignore the z axis. We can focus on two dimensional, like this. Uh, yeah, like this. If we are talking about, or you can just put z equal to zero. I think that's better. So go ahead and do the first example, which is right here. I'll give you exactly one minute. I will, I will wait for your picture. So once again, do it quickly and share it into the group. Uh, and then we can move on to our next um, exercise. I'm going to mute myself for a minute, uh, do the work, and then I'm going to continue with the, with the, with the slides. Uh, so do we need to include the W? Excellent. Two people send their messages. I want to uh, quickly ask uh, who is. Uh, oh, yeah, Zulhelmi, right? Uh, Zulhelmi, you are the first person to send your solution. Correct work, by the way. You get a bonus point on the spot. Thank you. Congratulations. Uh, Zulhelmi, I'm going to write it down so that I don't, that I don't forget. Zulhelmi, one bonus point. Because being the very first person to submit the answer, I, I don't really know whether it's, I don't care whether it was correct or not. Just because you participated, you get the point. Um, that, by the way, one bonus point means 1% of your carry box. is already guaranteed. Uh, for those who have not participated, uh, I will expect your participation later on. Otherwise, uh, there will be repercussions. Um, whether or not we completed this task or not, uh, please uh, perform and participate. So this is the answer. Uh, let's move on to the next example. So now um, this is exactly the same thing now, but now in 3D. Again, uh, now you have a Z value, plot the vector describing this point in space, vector in matrix form describing the same point, and then you know the usual, send the point, send the solution to the, to the, to the Telegram group. Now I know you, some of you might be thinking, this is too easy. I know this is too easy, but this is step number one. I cannot begin working with you in the difficult matrix operations from the beginning. I have to start somewhere. And this is somewhere. So if you want to have a good start and you want to have a good introduction into the tough stuff, which will come, go with me now. Start from now. Otherwise, you will have to jump 10 steps on your own. 
So do the easy work now with me, build your knowledge and experience, and then we can work on the tough stuff together later on, okay? So once again, I'll expect to see solutions. Uh, there are people doing this, very good. Uh, I still see, uh, I want to see your three-dimensional work. Uh, someone did it uh, very, very clearly and very nicely organized, very good. Uh, some of you might be using software. I discourage the use of software because um, uh, you must be have to be able, you might require you might be required to do some work like that, that would require hands uh, uh, manual work. So I don't I, I don't mind using software, but uh, as long as you know what you what you're doing, and you are developing your manual skills as well. Okay, so uh, I think that's enough for the third example. Uh, some people, uh, yeah. So I have someone's solution copy this exactly. So this is awesome. Okay, so now let's uh, move on to the next example. Again, uh, the third example, uh, which is uh, this particular example, which is a line example. Given the two points, uh, coordinates, as you can see here, do the following. Plot the picture describing this line in space, arrow pointing to point two. Write in vector form or in, in matrix form um, the thing that describes this line. Once again, I want to see solutions. Make sure that you get the coordinates correctly. Uh, oh. Yeah, I'll give you a minute to do this and then I'll be back. Uh, I'll unmute for a minute and I'll be back in a minute. Okay, so here's the solution for the third part. Uh, essentially, you have to plot your, although I said no scaling is required for, but you have to try your best to, to draw. For this one, unfortunately, you may need a little bit of scaling. So this is the first point, 10, 7, and 2. And then you have here the second point, which is negative 11, and then uh, 12, and then 3. And then since the arrow is pointing to point 2, which is this point right here, so you have to draw x2 minus x1 right here. Since point two, uh, you don't have to write things or take pictures. This whole thing is recorded, remember, yeah? Uh, but it's up to you if you want to take pictures, or if you want to scan this shot right here. So since we are pointing from point two, two point two, so it's going to have to be p2 minus p1, or point two minus p1, and therefore you will get the values, and therefore this is the, ma the, the matrix form. So this is delta bx or delta x, this is delta, excuse me, delta y, this is delta Z, and this is W, which will always be there from with us. So W has two values. It's either one or zero. One for a regular vector, and one for a directional vector. That's all there is to it. Excuse me, uh, one for a regular vector, and zero for a directional vector. Oh, good, an example about directional vector. So let's go. Let's go ahead with this example now. And once again, um, given those angles, uh, alpha, beta, gamma, describing a direction in space, plot the line in space and show how these angles describe this direction. Try your best to uh, recreate the diagram that I showed here in this, one, this particular one. It doesn't have to be represent exactly the values or exactly 20%, whatever. Try your best to show where that 20 is, where the 30 is, and so on. Then write the, the vector itself, the way we wrote it before, like sine beta, sine alpha, and so on and so forth. So go ahead and do that. Again, I'll give you a couple of minutes and then uh, I will take a look at your solution.
Okay, so here we go. Uh, so basically, I'm gonna uh, I'm keeping an eye on uh, the group uh, and those who participate. And uh, quite simply, guys, if I look for three hours and I realize that you have been with us for three hours and you have not participated, not even once, I will put you as absent, regardless of the QR code or your or your your availability on Teams. All of these things are not relevant to me. You have to show uh, your participation. Sir, I saw everything, but I didn't understand. Well, you should have asked a question. If you are here and you are dormant, you are not participating, then unfortunately, um, you are uh, not here with us. You know what I mean? So uh, please uh, make sure that you are actively participating in uh, the group. So I don't ask you to give me the correct answer. I just ask you to participate. Good or wrong, that's not a problem. We are not in a test, not in a quiz. All we need is that for you to participate in the class with the group, okay? So if I don't understand what to do, ask if you are struggling with something, ask. Excuse me, sir, I did not understand this part. Could you repeat again with all pleasure? Okay, just ask and do your part, participate, uh, ask, and then you will, and then we will, uh, I will take it to there. Otherwise, if you don't ask, then I'm going to assume everything is fine. If you don't participate, then uh, you are not here. Okay, that's enough talk. Let's move on to the solution. So this obviously is a symbolic way of representing this. Sir, this does not look like a 20. It's fine. I did not ask this to be scaled. Just a simple drawing showing this line between Z and the line, yes. Gamma, uh, this is a wrong symbol. Yeah? It's supposed to be gamma, yeah? So gamma is 10, so gamma is between the Z axis and the line, you could go, and this 20 is between the line and X axis, yes. And this is the Y, excuse me, this is the X axis, which is the 30 degrees, and this is the Y axis, we could go. I, in this drawing here, I did not label the axis, but if you did, then it should be right. So can I just put cos 30, I don't have to put the value here. That's also acceptable, but it's better if you calculate the value. So cosine 30 is 0.866, cosine 20, cosine 10, and you put the values here and look at the value of W. Once again, pay attention to the value of W. W is equal to zero when we are dealing with a directional vector. But if you are dealing with a positional vector, then W is equal to one. That's all that we need to understand about W. There's no other values for W. We will never have any other values for W. It's either one or zero. When do we need one? If it's a positional vector. When do we need zero? If it's a directional vector. That's all you need to understand about W. Any questions so far? Uh, sir. Go ahead. Uh, I want to ask about the angle, this one, the 1.4. If I plot the point, but using the value that I cal calculated using the cost, instead uh, of just showing 20, 30, and 10. No, that's fine, that's fine with me. As long as the, the value, I mean, you mean you just put the value directly without writing this line, is that it? I mean, I, yeah, I use the 0 0.86, 0 0.93. That's fine, but I think it's a better organization of your work is that you, somewhere in your solution, you write this down. You see, uh, uh, this is a good question, by the way. Uh, sir, should I put my steps or just the values directly? I think that's what you meant in your question. I think you just put this answer directly, but you did not put this line here or these lines. Is that what you meant? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. And also about the plotting. Yeah. Plotting the plotting, the yeah. I mean, the, if you, I, when I put the plot here, I did not exactly put it to scale. Obviously, this is not 10 degrees. 10 degrees should be better than this, right? Mm -hmm. So if you tried your best to make it uh, better, it's fine. Even if you didn't scale it, it's also fine. Uh, as long as you geometrically show me that this angle is between the line and the z-axis, that's what we are here for. And this value is the corresponding value between the line and the y-axis. And this so one as long, is, as, yeah, long as, as we as label them. Yes, that's okay. the correct one. Okay. Now, something that you said earlier that about these steps, you may not have written cos 30 equal to 0.866, and you directly put these numbers directly here. Now, yeah. this simple example um, is fine, but then let's just assume for a minute that you made a mistake in the calculations and you put the wrong numbers. You get know what I mean? Mm, yeah. Now, you may have, now, let's say if that was the case and you only put the values, then I have nothing to give you. Like, I, I don't have anything else. You only put the values and your values are wrong, so you get nothing. 
But if you put the steps, and that just so happened that there'd be a mistake here, at the very least, I know that what you're doing. You, maybe you use the um, radiant by mistake or not, but you know, you, you put 30, but the calculator was on radiant, for example, right? So you got a wrong number here. Mm -hmm. I can see that you did the right steps, but then you made some calculated error. So in this case, I will give you some marks because of the steps are complete. I so see, understood. Point, yeah, so the point is, uh, when you can, try to put some steps there so that you show your work. In the event that you're right, good to go. But in the event that you're wrong, at least you have some safety net. Is that clear? Okay, understood, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. So let's move on now to the next one. So now that we have done some exercises about lines and points, now we are ready to talk about the frame matrix. Now I know that we we're supposed to go for a break now, but we started uh, a bit late. You know what? Let's go for a break now. Yeah. Let's go for a quick short break, five minutes, and then we have a fresh mind, and then we talk about the frame matrix. Okay? So that will be uh, in, in line with our timing of this course. So a quick five minutes break, and then I'll see you in about, uh, we'll, we'll start again at five o'clock. So I'll see you in about five minutes. Take care. Uh, sir. Uh, go ahead. Uh, what about the QR, sir? Oh, yeah, I'll give it now. Uh, after the break, you will see it, OK? Yeah. Thank you for the reminder. Sir? Yes, uh, we're going to go for a small break. I'm going to get your QR code, yeah? Uh, is this sufficient or do I have to share it in the Telegram group already or uh, as well? It's fine. Okay. It's fine, sir. Okay. Also, sir, can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, can you explain again like how to determine the W, the weight? Okay, I will talk about that um, after the break. Is that right? Yeah, sure. Thank you, sir. Okay. You're welcome.
All right, so let's continue with our class. There was one question earlier about the value for W and how do we determine the value for W? Uh, actually, there's not much of a determining to do. It's only two values, two possibilities only. Just now when we work with vectors, there are two types of vectors. One vector describes a point, which is, has a distinctive distance, is that right? If you take these three values, for example, and you can find the magnitude, sigma x squared, sigma y squared, sigma uh, z squared, under the square root, you find the actual length here. The same thing for this vector right here. These two vectors, the position vectors, um, because they are position vectors and they describe an actual length apart from the direction, well, that's why we will, we will put w equal to one. So whenever we are dealing with a positional vector, then w or the weight will be one. And if you are dealing with a directional vector like this guy, see, this is an arrow. It doesn't have an end. We don't know where this arrow ends. This could be this length, which is still valid. Everything we see is still valid, or it could be all the way up to here. It's still everything valid. So basically, uh, the directional vector has no magnitude. And therefore, the concept of scaling would not work. So when we are dealing with a directional vector, we put w equal to uh, 0. So if you want to, you, if you wanted the writing, for example, right? So we can say that W is equal to one for uh, positional or position vectors. Whenever we are dealing with a position, for example, and W equal to uh, zero for directional vectors. And when, we, when do you know that you are dealing with position or direction? You are dealing with position when you have actual coordinates, like x, y, z, lengths. If you think about it, x, y, z itself are lengths. This is x, this is y, and this is z. These are actual values, actual length. But when you are dealing with a directional vector, you don't have length. You have angles. You have, you know, you have joints. You have basically angular changes or angles. You don't have an actual length. When you are dealing with a directional vector, there is not a value of length anywhere. You just have angles. You know? So if you're dealing with an actual vector that contains only angles, then W is zero, or the weight is zero. W is zero means that there is no scale at all, so we're going to ignore the weight. And when we are dealing with W equal to one, that means there is a scale, but we're going to put a scale equal to one. That's it. Now, the main significance of one and zero, or W altogether, does not make any sense right now, I understand. But once we talk about the frame matrix, it will make perfect sense. So let's move on. If, if the answer does not fully, uh, if the response does not fully answer your question, um, Alia, just give it, give it a minute. Uh, once we discuss the frame matrix, I hope it will make more sense to you. Okay? Okay, okay thank you, sir. You're welcome. So let's, move, let's move on now to the next slide. So now let's talk about the frame matrix. The reason why we discuss points and lines, because these are the building blocks for the frame. So what is a frame now? So let's define something new that we're going to be working with in the next five or six weeks. A frame in the real world, in the world of mathematics, essentially is a new, is a movable coordinate system. You see, this x and y z is essentially a frame. It's this x and y z coordinates, the blue coordinates you see here. If you think about it, it also represents a frame, a global frame, like an edge of a box right here. Well, we can also define our own. Um, movable frame, another frame, a smaller frame, as you can see here, a frame is a movable coordinate system that can describe a subspace or a smaller world within it. Meaning inside this smaller frame here, we're going to describe another world here. This other world is just, um, you know, within this frame only, as you can see here. All right. Now, everything we can see here, we're going to call it a frame. So right here, frame A is a subspace or a smaller world within the global or the main coordinates. So far, so good? OK, let's move on now. Uh, well, this smaller world, or frame A, right, can then be described, can be considered a new coordinate system on its own. We can think of it as a new coordinate system with its own local coordinates. Right now, you're going to start to hear names that you are familiar with. Uh, if you remember in the earlier definitions or terminologies or fundamentals, we did talk about local and global coordinates. We did talk about NOA before. So this now, hopefully, it will start to make sense. 
And you're gonna, we're gonna, de- we're gonna have this feeling a lot as we go on with kinematics. You're gonna see names and terminologies that we have introduced in the earlier chapters. So once again, in this smaller world, I mean, can then be described with its own coordinate system. And this own local coordinate system can also be, uh, can also be defined separately. So this will become N uh, representing the local X axis, and this will be O representing the local Y axis, and this is A representing the Z axis. So that's representing N O A that we discussed and defined in the fundamentals, I think chapter one or session number one. So now let's take a look at this point right here, this green dot. Let me uh, enable my pointer. Okay, so this point right here, the green dot, uh, right now this point is residing within the space here, within this local space, all right? So let's consider this point shown here, and the coordinates of this point can be defined based on two global, uh, based on two coordinate systems. I can define the coordinates of this point according to the global coordinate system. As you can see here, Px, Py, and Pz, exactly to the same way we did in our previous exercise. All right? We can say that the position or the point P can be defined according to these three values, Px, Py, and Pz. And that would be according to the global x-axis. Sir, uh, this point is inside this other frame. Not a problem. This whole frame, the smaller frame, is also within the global frame. So anything inside it is also inside the global frame. But we can also describe the same point in a different coordinate values. But now, according to the local coordinates, we can say Pn, Po, and Pa meaning the NOA coordinates of the same point, but this time with according to this local axis or the moving axis. Is that clear? Uh, uh, once again, any question at any time, just, uh, just uh, unmute and then ask. Okay, so now, as you can see now, there are two sets of coordinates that we can describe the same point. We have a set of coordinates that is according to the global axis, and we have a set of coordinates that is according to the local axis. And as you can clearly see visually, those values are not the same. Px here, for example, as you can see, this length here is definitely not equal to Pn. And Po is definitely not equal to Py. And Pz is definitely not equal to Pa. Although n represents the local x, but that is the local x axis, not the same as the global x axis. Is that clear? So as you can see in the figure, although the both coordinates describe the same point, the values of x, y, z, and n, o, a are not necessarily equal. There will be a need for us to convert between these two coordinates. Sir, is it possible that we could have the values are the same? Yes. It's possible that uh, this small frame is positioned in such a way that n will be exactly the same as x. By simply taking this whole frame and putting it somewhere here, and the point will be somewhere here, so n and x will be the same. But that's um, coincidence or just only in that particular situation. But let's just say, this is, that's why I said not necessarily. It's not always not equal, but it's not necessarily equal. Is that clear? Okay, so now uh, we need to describe this frame, uh, this frame right here, mathematically. In the same way we described a line and a dot using matrices and vectors, we also need to describe a frame. And that is the real reason why we did lines and points. See, the first thing about the frame is its location. And the location of the frame is described in the point of its origin. This point right here, we can think of it like the 0, 0, 0 of this particular frame, right? Is the very first thing that we need to describe about this frame. So that's why the first column you see here is the position vector of this point, which we did before earlier, like an hour ago, when we described the x and y and z. And notice that this x, y, and z are according to the global frame. When you want to describe the location of this frame, you cannot use its own coordinates. It's not gonna work. Otherwise, that would be zero, 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 right? So you need to describe it in terms of the global frame. So that's why we have X, Y, and Z. Up to this point, up to this um, concept here. Any questions? Okay, moving on. The next thing we need to describe is the orientation of the frame. You see this frame right here, in this particular orientation is defined with three directional vectors, N, O, and A. I can reorient this frame, but then I have to move these three lines. Is that right? Yes, there is a 90 degree angle between them. That will have to be maintained, but then 
I can still reorient this frame according to the right hand rule. If right now you are, you are forming the coordinate system with your right hand, um, thumb, and index, and middle finger, then you can actually move your hand around. Those 90 degrees relationship between them will still be there, but then uh, you can still reorient uh, the frame. Uh, let me uh, give you a visual example of the right hand rule. Uh, and that's perfect, right here. So uh, if you are actually right now, you can actually form uh, a coordinate system with your hand. You can call this uh, Z, and this is X, and this is Y, and maintain this orientation, or maintain this relationship between your fingers. You can just move your hand around, you can turn it, twist it, but then the fingers will always maintain a 90 degrees angle between them. And this way, uh, this is actually even better. So this way you can actually uh, reorient the frame, but without changing the 90 degrees association between these two, uh, these two coordinates. So once again, in order to define the orientation of this frame, we need to define the, the, the directions of these three lines. And how we describe the direction of a vector? I think we discussed that a while ago. So as we discussed before, you need to describe the direction of the directions of three vectors, of three lines, N, O, A. And once again, those are errors. There's no ending. Where is that error end? It could be at the end of the world, it could be here, right? We just care about their directions. So therefore, you need now three sets of angles. This line right here will need three angles, alpha, beta, gamma, for this guy. And we need alpha, beta, gamma for this guy, and we need alpha, beta, gamma for this guy. And that's exactly what's mentioned here. The direction vector is described using three angles, alpha, beta, gamma, between it and the global axis. And that is why um, for these three lines, N, O, A, we will need three sets of alpha, alpha beta, and gamma. For n, we need alpha n, beta n, and gamma n. And for, for o, we need alpha o, beta o, and gamma o, and so on and so forth. Is that clear? Uh, so do we need to really know these angles? Oh, that's a lot of angles. Uh, just bear with me for a minute. Just uh, move, just carry on. Oh, bear with me for a minute. Things will make sense um, in a while, in a few slides. More specifically, we, cannot, we don't need the angles. We need their cosines. That, so we need, <laughs> it's even more complicated now. We need cosine alpha n and cosine beta n and cosine gamma n and so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean, so for to describe the three lines, we need three sets of cosines. Is that clear? As we said earlier, the same way we did in our previous example uh, and workshop, we described this line right here. So we described one line only, we need the three angles. To describe three lines, we need three sets of angles. Is that clear? So that's what is shown here. Okay. So now let's, let's simplify things a little bit. Let's define something new. Since these three angles are meant for n, so when I describe something called nx, which is simply equal to cosine alpha n. So in other words, rather than saying all of this, cosine alpha n every time, we're just going to call it nx. So from now until the end of the semester, we will never use this terminology again. We will only use nx. But you have to put a mental note to understand that nx really means cosine the angle formed between this line and the x-axis. And ny means cosine the angle formed between the line and the y-axis. And nz means the same thing, but for the z-axis. Is that clear? So nx, ny, and nz simply means the cosines of the angles between the line and x and y and z coordinates. Same thing for OX, OY, and OZ, and then AX, and AY, and AZ. Up to this point, any questions? Okay, let's put it all together now. And now, when we take those N's and O's and A's, we can put them in the frame matrix, and then we can have the frame matrix in front of you. This frame matrix, which is essentially a compound or combination of, of several vectors, uh, it describes the position and orientation of the frame in space. The position is described by the position vector, as you can see here, which is px, py, pz, in terms or in reference to the global frame. And the three lines that we want to describe their orientation are described here. Nx, ny, nz, and since these are directional vectors, so they get a 0, 0, 0 here. And since this is a positional vector, it gets a 1 here. And once again, hopefully you'll remember what nx simply means. nx simply means cosine the angle between n and the global x-axis. And for example, az simply means cosine the angle between a 
and the z-axis. And OY simply means cosine the angle between O and the y-axis. So far, so good. Any questions before we go to the next slide? Okay, good. Let's keep going. Oh, good. Exercise time. So now let's do the very first exercise. So the exercise here is giving the following information about a frame. You have this frame in front of you. You have PX. Uh, maybe you need to take a mental note of this, or you have the slides with you. I mean, I only have it on, um, on Moodle. So given this information now, PX is equal to 12.4. PY is equal to this, PZ is equal to that, and you're given the corresponding AN, BN, uh, sorry, uh, alpha N, B, uh, beta N, and gamma N, and the rest of the information you see in front of you, develop the frame matrix. Go ahead and do it. So uh, once again, I'll uh, exercise time. So complete the task and send the solution to the Telegram group. So essentially now, uh, the exercise is, uh, you have some information about a frame, you have position and angles, so go ahead and construct the frame matrix. The template for the frame matrix is shown in the previous slide, which you should have with you right now. So I mean, the, you can find the slides and the exercise, by the way, on Moodle. So go ahead and develop the frame matrix, and I'll give you a minute to do so. I'm going to mute myself, and then I'm going to wait for solutions. Uh, sir, Okay, so I hope that uh, this was relatively easy for you to do, maybe time consuming, yes. Unfortunately, this is something that you'll have to get familiar with, that uh, the matrix operations uh, will be a little bit tedious, uh, time consuming, fairly. So, yep, someone sent the answer. Uh, thank you. I think it's Korea, yeah, Korea. I hope I'm pronouncing your names correctly, by the way. <laughs> if I mispronounce your name, I apologize. So yes, so based on the values, you just have to organize the values, right? So you can see N, X, N, Y, and Z, so cosine the angle. The signs uh, look for alpha N. Alpha N is somewhere here, yeah. So alpha N is 75.2. So cosine 75.2 is 0.3 is right here. And then beta N is uh, 58.7. And gamma N is 36.9, you can see here. You can just simply uh, plug the values and you can use those slides, uh, this formula right here to calculate the values for NX. Remember, the, the frame matrix essentially is this. And all you have to do is to find the values for NX, NY, and Z, and OX, and so on, and so on, and so forth, right? The values for PY, and P, uh, PY PX, and PZ are given straight away, but then you just have to calculate those cosines. 
The question did not give me the cosines directly, it gave you the angles. All you have to do is just calculate the cosine. Make sure your angle in your calculator is on degrees, and then you simply plug in and calculate it and then populate the matrix. Uh, once again, uh, whether you uh, uh, finished or not, make sure you do uh, submit to showcase your participation. Now, do not cheat yourself by simply reading other people's solution and then copying it. You're only going to cheat yourself. I want you to do it yourself and then perform the task accordingly. So again, calculate the cosines. Once you have the values, then uh, plug in, and here we go. This is the frame matrix that describes this frame right here. The orientation matrix is here, and the positional vector is right here. Okay. So? Yes. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. I want sure. to ask for yeah this question. Do we have to plot and draw the frame? No, no, no. The question did not ask you to plot. I mean, in the yeah. future or no, the, um, unless the question explicitly asks you to plot, which I will never do, by the way. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so uh, no, uh, but uh, again, you bring another good point. Valid point here is that you should do only what the question asks. You should not do extra work. You simply look at the question statement. Did it ask you to plot? If the answer is no, then don't plot. Because if you do something extra that is the question did not ask for, and then you make a mistake, you lose marks. And this is a dilemma here. Yeah? If you did it right, you, lose, you get no extra points because if the question didn't ask you to do it in the first place. But if you did something extra and then you make a mistake, then you get deducted. It's kind of unfair, but unfortunately, that is the truth. Okay, so right. let's find the future. Make sure that you read the statement correctly and then uh, answer only with the question wanted. Nothing less, nothing more. All right. Okay? Thank you, Sue. You're welcome. So let's move on now. Now, now we have a, a, a sort of a brief idea of what is a frame. So how is it related to robotics? And how is it used in the well, in robot kinematics and in robotics in general, right? Um, the frames actually describe the position and orientation of every joint, tool, and sensor for anything significant on the robot. Every one of these robots is described. When I say described, I mean position and orientation, yeah, in uh, a frame matrix. So, for example, uh, this joint right here is. Oh, by the way, remember what I told you earlier that the coordinates of n and x could be the same. Here's an example of that. If the point was right here, then the position for n and n, x will be the same. And the same thing for y and z, by the way. So this particular frame, it just happens to be uh, very similar or exactly the same as the global frame. But as you can see here in other frames, right, you have this frame and you have this frame and you have this frame. This is a two-dimensional example. You could imagine z axis is coming out of the sheet towards you. So uh, this is x, this is y, and z is coming out of the sheet. So this is second frame, this is third frame, and this is fourth frame. And in every one of these frames describes the position and orientation of an item on the robot, and this is significant important for us. This is a real life example of a robot. Um, and as you can see, the frames are shown to describe the, the, the position and orientation of every significant joint on the robot. Here's another real life example in, in kinematics. Um, Examples and again, as you can see, this particular frame right here, x pause x. This frame right here is frame zero. And how do you know it's frame zero? Because zero, zero, zero. And this right here is frame number one because you can see x one, y one, z one, and so on and so forth. You can see that as we go along until the end, we get six frames. Um, these are now frames apply not just in uh, manipulators. Frames apply also in any kind of robot, even mobile robots and humanoids. Because the concept of frames is that they describe a relative position and orientational change. Oh, let me slow down here. The frames really, what they do is they describe the difference between this guy and this guy. Not only the difference in the physical difference, but also the difference in position, number one, you can see that they are positioned differently, and then they are oriented differently. So we need to know these differences if you want to describe uh, program this robot. For example, in, in this particular example, the reason why we need a frame here, because this is where the sensor is. But then this sensor is placed here, but then the robot begins here. What if there's an item here? What happens? So the sensor will have its own range, but then we need to adjust that range to fit here. 
that's why we need these two frames right here. Okay, um, this may not make sense to you now because we, uh, in mobile robotics, frames slightly work differently. They have different meanings, but the concept is the same, that they are used to describe the relative differences in position and orientation among significant items on the robot. This is a real life example of a humanoid robot. Those uh, green and yellow and blue lines are actually frames. They describe uh, different joints. This is a one joint, three, one to three joints. One to three joints, uh, actually they describe the wheels actually down there. This is the shoulder joint, uh, and then elbow joint, and a bunch of another a couple of joints here. Over here is a bunch of sensors. So uh, yeah, so this is a real life example taken from ROS, the robot operating system example. As you can see, frames in robotics are significant. Basically, they are the building blocks for kinematics. That's why understanding frames is a, is a, is a key, important element to understanding uh, uh, kinematics. Uh, okay, let's get back to our example. Okay, so when we do kinematics, what are we doing exactly? Okay, I understand that this is a frame, and this is a frame, and this is a frame. Okay, what's next? Well, here's the thing. The study of kinematics, Really, what does it do? What's going on here? It's involved transforming, transforming back and forth between the robot frames. What does that mean? Means you're starting from here at this position and orientation, you want to end up eventually here. So, in order to do this, first you'd have to reorient this guy and then trans move along this length until you get here. And then from here, you have to move along this length until you're here. So, basically, you have to transform from one frame to the next. Sometimes we go in this direction, uh, aka forward. Sometimes we go back in this direction, aka reverse or inverse. So whether it's regardless of the direction of the movement, we need to know how to do transformation. And that's why the second section or the second chapter of this discussion or next week discussion is about transformation. So transformation essentially is about moving forward from one frame to the next frame. So we are here, we move to here. And we move to transform to here, then transform to here. To go back to the previous example, this is a significant and lovely example showing you that you started from here and then you transform to this frame, then transform to this frame, then to this, then to this, and then and so on and so forth. So by understanding how to do these transformations, then you know how to do kinematics. So far, so good. It's okay, sir. I saw, oh, okay, sorry, the wrong call. Okay, so now, uh, now that we understand what kinematics is, and we also understand what um, a frame, no, I'm sorry, not kinematics. We understand what frame is, and we understand what, briefly, what transformation is. Before we get to talk about transformation next week, we need to talk about the frame matrix again, or the properties of the frame matrix. We need to understand how does the frame matrix work. And see, the frame matrix, that we have learned today has some unique features that does not apply to the regular matrix that you have seen and worked with before. Um, the matrix that you have seen in, at the end of this example right here it has these zeros and ones in the end. And this is significant. And this has something that you have not, probably have not seen in other previous matrix operations before. So let's take a look at that, at this feature. Okay, so the very first thing you need to understand about the frame matrix is that it is actually a compound matrix. Compound matrix, essentially, what does that mean really? Um, it's, not a, um, it's not a generic matrix that was um, by itself or was not developed by itself. It was essentially glued together from smaller matrices. In fact, we can see those components right here. This is right here is what we call sometimes the three by three uh, rotational matrix or orientational matrix. Other names include R, simply R. By looking at in some other robotics book, you might see that this matrix is simply referred to as the R matrix. The R means the rotational matrix, simple as that. That's another word for uh, the rotational matrix. Simply, other words is R matrix, of R simply by itself, and that also means the same thing that we are talking about the three by three matrix, ignoring everything else. Sometimes we're going to ignore the zeros and we're going to ignore the position and focus our attention only here. You know what I mean, so that's why um, 
especially when we are dealing with pure rotation, for example. We can ignore everything else. We're going to focus only inside the R matrix. The position vector, also sometimes called uh, simply uh, P, or P vector. So this is simply sometimes called P for prismatic light position, or sometimes called P vector, or sometimes matrix, even though that it's a weak name, but because it's a uh, Obviously, a uh, three by one matrix, but we usually refer to these as vectors. Okay, I mean, so whether it's P vector, P matrix, or P by itself, then it, it's the same meaning. Essentially, it represents the position. And once again, when we are dealing sometimes with pure, um, with pure translation or pure linear motion, we can ignore everything else and focus only on these three points right here. Okay? And finally, down there is the zeros and ones. Hopefully now you'll see the significance of adding the scales in the bottom. Although these three scales here, zeros and one, excuse me, the zeros here are just zeros. They have no purpose really. Actually, they do have a real purpose. And the purpose is to make the, the, the matrix a square matrix, a four by four. Without the scales, we will have a three by four matrix. And that will give us headaches later on in the future when we deal with matrix operations. So to resolve this problem, and especially like matrix multiplication and stuff like that, we added the scales. So although they do not change anything in the values above them, the zeros here, they do not affect the magnitudes of the orientation, and the one here does not affect the magnitude of the position. It is just put here just to make sure, just to make the scale a square, uh, sorry, just to make the matrix a square matrix so that it becomes easier to work with. Is that clear? So that is essentially the purposes of the scale. So in the future, uh, I hope um, earlier, right? Who asked me earlier about the scale? This is it, really. This is the only. This is the. the from now on, we'll just have to remember these three zeros and ones. You will never work with vectors on their own or positions on their own, like we did in the earlier examples. The earlier examples were the purpose of them was just to give an idea about uh, graphics and vectors. But as, once we come to this point. We will never work with individual vectors and magnitudes uh, on their own. We're only going to work with this matrix uh, as a whole. Okay? So the matrix as a whole, as you can see, has zeros at the bottom and one here, and then three positions, and the three by three uh, cosines or nx or a position uh, matrix. So once again, put this in mind that this is a compound matrix. Why is this significant? Because later on, when we do things with it, uh, we have to put in mind that this is a compound matrix. Uh, any questions before I move forward? I think we can finish early today, like six plus, six something. We don't have to go until seven, which is good news. Uh, or maybe we can have time to do some examples. Or maybe I will have time to answer questions regarding C++. I think that's a good idea, if you have any. Okay, so uh, any questions so far up to this point? Okay, let's keep going. So, uh, oh, yeah, so the magnitude of the vectors n or a is equal to one. Since they are directional vectors, which are unity by definition, unit equal to magnitude is equal to one, this could be very useful um, if we only have two out of three angles. Oh, yeah, sorry, um, this is the, next, the second problem. Uh, the first property was the fact that it's a compound matrix. Now let's pay attention to the second property. Now, let's pay attention only on one of these at a time. Let's just focus on N, for example. Yeah? Let's just ignore these other two for the minute. So pay attention to the fact that N, 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 X, and this matrix right here is a unit vector. Okay? The magnitude of the unit vector, is N, for example, is equal to 1. So the magnitude of this matrix is equal to 1. And if the magnitude is equal to 1, and therefore this could be very helpful if I only have two angles, and not three of them, can anyone answer to me, how is that useful? And if you answer it correctly, very, you know, audio, right? I'll give you a bonus one. For example, if I have NX only and one Y only, and NZ, uh, I don't give you NZ. Okay, just a blank box here. And I ask you to solve the question. And you can still find NZ. Can somebody tell me how you can do that? And if you know it correctly, I'll give you a bonus point on the spot. Anyone? Any takers? Uh, 
you minus. Uh, what's your name? What's your name? Uh, Erfan, yeah, okay, go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Fun. Uh, can you just uh, 180 minus the two angles? Uh, no, incorrect. Sorry. And that is a wrong answer. Anyone else? Uh, sir, does this mean that the PX, PY, PZ still, is still there? Uh, we're, not talking about, we're not talking about PX, PY, PZ. We're talking about only N, yeah? The focus is here, yeah? Let's just assume for a second. Okay, let's uh, so is it we have to uh, yeah. is it we have to use the inverse well, wait, wait, wait. before before that yeah uh, who was before you talking I think Adriana right uh, come yeah, yeah, uh, are you answering uh, or asking a question sorry Loga I'll get back to you in a minute Adriana okay, sir. Uh, I'm asking a question what's your question again about the px py and pz I no, mean no. Is it still available there, even though the ANZAC is not given? Uh, it's relevant. Uh, not related. Uh, the values of PXPRBZ, let's just assume they're all given, okay? Oh, okay. And in fact, let's assume everything is given in this matrix here, except NZ. Okay? Only NZ is not given. Or only one. Okay, for now, well, let's just assume that NZ is not given in this, this line we're talking about right now, right? Uh, so, even though it's not given, right? You can still find it. Can somebody tell me how? And if you answer it correctly, I'll give you the bonus. I love that you were saying something. Uh, do we need to use the inverse kinematic? Like we have no. to do the inverse of it? No. And in fact, you don't need to know. Uh, the knowledge you need to solve this is already, you already learned it from a previous course. One Not even over robotics. A plus A minus, and then the matrix must have something zero one. If you are guessing, that that's not an answer, my friend. I cannot have a guess. If either you have a full answer or you don't know. Anyone else? Any takers? Bonus point. Go ahead, Alia. Yes, Alia. Um, is it shift ten x of y? Uh, no. Okay. What was that? Helmi? I think it was Helmi, right? Uh, can we use Pythagoras to find it? Uh, no. Oh, all right. It looks like you all, any last call, anyone? Okay, it looks like you all forgot that uh, for any victor in the world, right? what's the formula for magnitude? Can somebody remind me what's the formula for magnitude of a victor? I square plus y square square root, sir. Yeah, exactly. It's the square root plus QRT, right, of x square, right? Uh, that's not, yeah, x square, what is that? What is the symbol? Yeah. That's, oh, I can say one thing. X square plus y square plus z square, is that right? Yes. And uh, if you, uh, well, let me just write it down here. You know what? I'll do this again. So, V here. So, this is Z and this is Y. Okay? And uh, this is the magnitude. Is that, this is the formula for magnitude. The square root, the QRT is for square root for Z. So, if you know the magnitude of the. So, if you know these three values, right? If you know these three values, Y and Z, we can calculate the magnitude of the victim. Is that right? Do you agree? So can you repeat that? Your mic is uh, cutting off. Okay, I'll say that again. The formula for magnitude of a victim essentially is, is specifically a square root of x squared plus y squared and z squared. Are we uh, familiar with this one? Magnitude of the victim. This is basically math calculates one on one, really. Magnitude of a victim. I'm going to actually Google it for you now and show you the formula. Uh, online uh, in the, probably in a better way. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so this is a good example of it. So a magnitude of a victim essentially is equal to x squared, y squared, and z squared. These are the components you see right here. Is that right? So um, if you know the magnitudes of x and y and z, then you can put them in the formula and then you can put them here and you can calculate the magnitude. Is that right? So for example, well, in this particular example, we do know how we don't have the vector, the magnitude of the victor. This is equal to one because it's a unit vector. 
we just said it that because it's a unit vector, it has a magnitude of one. Is that right? It's right here. The magnitude of vectors n or a is equal to one because they are directional vectors. And since they are magnitude of equal to one, well, um, we have this equation right here. So we can say that one is equal to all of this. Is that right? So now, if we have only two and we don't have this guy, we can solve for it. You know what I mean? If let's say we have x and y available to us, we can then solve it using this equation. We can simply say, since the magnitude is equal to one, we can plug this equation right here, and we can put x and y, we can solve for z. Another way of seeing this is right here, in this example right here. If this was x and this was y and this was equal to one, we can just plug everything here and you can solve for the third value, which is z. Does that make sense? Is it clear for everyone? Concepts of vectors and unit vectors and directional vectors, this is not new. This is calculus 101 and statics 101. So I did not really teach anything new here. Is that clear? But if you didn't remember it, well, it's in the slides anyway. Uh, in fact, if I give you a matrix like this, if I go back here, right? Uh, where is it? Yeah. I go back here and I also hide these other two. Let's say I put this also here and put this guy here as well. This is still a valid question. You can still solve and find it because you can come here and apply the equation and solve for nz. You can also solve and find for all y. You can also solve and find for ax and you can still continue the question. So whether it is given all three of them or all of them like this, or some of them are missing, as long as you have two out of three, you can still solve this question. So this is the second property of the frame matrix. The frame matrix, because the directional vectors are um, magnitude of equal to one, you don't necessarily need to have all three angles. You only need two out of the three. Because once you have the two, then you can use this feature if the magnitude of the vector is equal to one, then you can calculate and find the third angle. If you want to see that visually, uh, go back all the way to our earlier drawing here. Yeah. If I don't give you the third angle here, let's say I give you only 20 and 30, then using the fact that the directional vector has a magnitude of one, you can then find the third angle using the feature of the, the frame matrix. Uh, sorry, this does not apply to general line in the world, yeah? This only applies to the frame lines, yeah? Those frame lines. It's clear to only NOA, not to the general line in space as you see here. It only applies to, to NOA, the, the coordinates of the frame in space. Is that clear about this point, about this issue? So once again, let's revise. The first feature about the frame matrix is that it's a compound matrix. The second feature about the frame matrix is that since those are directional vectors, N, O, and A, therefore the magnitude is equal to one. Therefore, you only can work with two out of the three angles. So if you have N, X, N, Y, you can calculate N, Z. If you have O, X, I don't worry, we're gonna, we're gonna do an example in a while, yeah? And then we can see uh, if any of the two, any of the three, doesn't have to be Z all the time missing. If X was missing, then you can use these two to find it. If Y was missing, you can use X and Z to find it, and so on. So, that clear? Perhaps with an example after a while, we will, we will, it will make sense to you. Okay, the next property or features of the frame matrix. Now, this is significant uh, because those, uh, by the way, uh, sorry, uh, sir, does that also apply to the position matrix? Now, let me ask you this question. This feature is for those three guys, for N and O and E. What about the position vector? Does it apply to them and why? Yes or no and why? Any takers? I'll repeat my question, yeah. Uh, we said earlier that this has a feature for the, uh, the NOA has a feature that because they are directional vectors, they have a magnitude of one and therefore you don't need all three angles. Any two of the three will do the trick. Okay, that's fantastic. What about this last vector, the position vector? Does this also apply to the position vector and why not? Anyone, any takers? So I'm Irvine. Go ahead, Irvine. 
Uh, I don't think so because uh, the position vectors are in coordinates. Yes, uh, the better example, the better answer would be that the position vector is not a directional vector, and it does not have a magnitude of one. It has a regular, a general magnitude, which is equal to p x squared plus y squared and z squared. So this does not apply to the position vector. It only applies to directional vectors because. The directional vectors, by definition, have a magnitude of one, but the position vector can have any magnitude, any infinite value of magnitude. So that's why this feature does not apply to the position of the vector. It only applies to uh, directional vectors. Okay, let's move on. The next feature of this, uh, of the frame matrix, uh, the, the fact that, uh, as we said earlier, since these are coordinate systems, uh, they must be perpendicular to each other, meaning they must form a 90 degrees angle between them. Otherwise, they will not be a valid coordinate system. If you go back to our very definition of frames, we say that a frame essentially describes a local coordinate system, a local um, world, a local coordinate system. Is that right? Essentially, it's a replica of this global coordinate system. And this global coordinate system must have a 90 degree angle between each other. So there's a 90 degree angle here, there's a 90 degree angle here, and there's a 90 degree angle between this guy. And let me uh, see if I can do this. Yeah, so right here, this is a 90 degree angle between x and y, and this is a 90 degree angle between x and z, and this is a 90 degree angle between x and z as well. Uh, yeah, so the same thing also must happen here. So again, this is a 90 degree angle, between N and O, and this is a 90 degree angle between O and A, and what's the third one? Uh, yeah, this is a 90 degree angle between N and A. So that must be the case, otherwise this will not be a valid coordinate system. Okay, all right, so what's the big deal? The big deal is, is because they are um, perpendicular to each other, like you see here, because they are perpendicular, their dot product must equal to zero. Can somebody remind me or tell me why is that the case? The why is, okay, since they are perpendicular, why is the dot product is equal to zero? The first person to get this right is bonus point, and I'm writing it down in case you don't believe me. Gloria, are you saying something? I cannot hear you. So once again, since the lines are perpendicular, their dot product must be equal to zero. My question right now is why the bonus point? Why is that the case? Uh, so go ahead. I guess it's because it is a direction vector and it uses cosine. So when it's 90 degree, it becomes zero. Um, you're 90% correct. If anyone else doesn't say anything, I'll give you the point. Anybody else? Well, what is the definition of the dot product? What's the formula for dot product? Uh, Adriana, you get the point, yeah? Congratulations. Because you're closest to the answer. So what's the, what's the definition of a dot product? You can Google it now and let me know. What's the formula for dot product? Uh, magnitude of A times... Magnitude of B multiplied by... Cosine theta. By cosine of the angle between them. Is that right? Yes, so since the angle between them is 90, cosine 90 is? Zero. And that is why, uh, basically, uh, is this the correct person, by the way, who answered just now? Was it Adriana or um, somebody else? <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was Adriana. OK, all right. All right, so essentially, uh, because the, the dot product, the formula for dot product is cosine, uh, nine, cosine the angle between them, magnitude A multiplied by magnitude B multiplied by the cosine of the angle, and the angle between them is 90, so therefore cosine the angle is zero, so that's why all of these are true. So N uh, dot A or N dot A, N, or the, and basically any of these three dot product by anyone else will give you zero. Similarly, if you take the cosine and the, the cross product and you apply it, I hope you remember the cross product rule, which you have to use the right hand rule. 
uh, if your thumb is uh, one and uh, if the index is the next line, then the, then the answer will be the third. Maybe also sometimes not right hand rule uh, cross, yeah, cross product. Okay, so yeah, that's the answer. So uh, this is A and this is B and this is the answer, the cross product, right? So if you take this as N and this is O, then the answer will be the third vector. You know what I mean? So that's what is meant over here. If you take N cross A, the answer will be the other vector, the third vector, and so on and so forth. So again, the right hand rule for the, the cross product that will give you this answer. But, so let's recap once again on the features, yeah? Uh, the first feature, matrix are a compound matrix. Second feature is that the fact that they are directional vector. So therefore, you don't need really all the three values. Even if these two uh, were missing, let's say this guy was also missing and this guy was also missing, you can still solve the question just fine. And the third feature we learned just now was the fact that, uh, that the dot product of any of N or A's will be equal to zero and the cross product will give us the third vector using the right hand rule. Is that clear? Any questions so far? Okay, so uh, I think it's time for exercise, but I will take a break first. So let's take a break. After that, this is the last break, yeah? After the last break, we will come back and do uh, exercises, and then we will deal with one more feature, which is the inverse, and this is a significant one, so that's why it will take us time in the last hour. So let's go for a quick break. If you don't want to take the break, if you want to work on the exercises, go ahead. It's the same thing. You can begin working on those two exercises. Uh, one exercise, which is the properties of the frame matrix. So you can take your break or you can work on the exercise. But anyway, I'll see you in about five minutes or in about seven to eight minutes. I'll see you at about six o'clock. Thank you. And I will see, uh, I'll use myself for now, then I'll see you in, in a few minutes. Take care.
Okay, so let's begin or let's resume the class. And I want to address something that is funny that just happened. Uh, last week, when we talked about possibility, yeah? possibility of groups and groups work, um, I remember I put the rules and the guidelines for group work. Is that right? And uh, I remember clearly uh, specifying that there is a deadline for it. And uh, I'm going to go back to that message and show you exactly that notice because it was very vividly clear to me. Uh, here we go. So see, it says tomorrow at 5. And the reason for that was is that because you had one week to work on the project and I needed to know whether you're gonna spend this one week working in a group or individual. Well, unfortunately, what happened today was that just now, right, I received an email, someone telling me, or a couple of people telling me that they wanna work in a group in the very last minute before the submission of the deadline assignment. Unfortunately, that doesn't work. Uh, and sadly, or unfortunately, as for deadlines, that you were supposed to inform me about the formation of your group within 24 hours of the notice, basically before Tuesday, 5 p.m. last Tuesday, huh? not tomorrow. Yeah? But when that didn't happen, nobody came forward. So uh, I took it as nobody worked in the group. So the issue was closed. So for those who requested to submit in a group in the very last minute, unfortunately, your request is rejected. Um, because it's way past, it's one week late. So you still have to submit uh, individual as a, uh, as a part of individual. Okay, so let's move on from that topic and get back to our discussion. I hope you had the time to do this exercise, but this exercise, as you can see, was, and I also can see that some people already uh, completed this assignment or completed this task in the group, which is uh, sort of encouraging. Thank you. I've seen, uh, yeah, excellent work from, uh, uh, yeah, a bunch of people in front of here. I can see uh, Putri, I think, is with, uh, different names in Telegram group and different names that I see in here. So uh, I hope I'm not mispronouncing your names or anything. Uh, okay, anyway, <laughs> you know you are good, good work. But anyway, the solution is right here. So. Uh, uh, essentially, uh, for the given angles, uh, you will have to find the cosines as usual, just like we did the previous example. And then you will see that you have this situation that you see in front of you with some values missing. Exactly what I drawn uh, here, okay? So once you have these values, then all you have to do is apply the formula for magnitude of vector, knowing that the direction of vector is actually R or have magnitude equal to one. So using the square root formula, then you can actually solve it this way. So since the magnitude of the direction of Victor is equal to one, therefore nx squared plus ny squared plus nz squared equal to one, then we lose this relationship and solve whatever is missing. So over here, what's missing is ny, then we can plug it and solve it. Over here, what's missing is oz, then we can solve it. And over here, what's missing is ax, then we can plug it and solve it. And as we're good to go, we can plug in the values and that will be the solution to this exercise, okay? And therefore, this is the, the solution. You can also, by the way, if you want to, to verify your work, there is a way to verify your work. Can somebody tell me how is it possible to verify this solution? Let's say I came up with this solution. You're in the middle of the test or you know, assignment, whatever, quiz, whatever, and you would like to verify your work. How can you do that? Can somebody tell me how? There are actually two ways to verify your work. Can we use the dot product to verify the answer? Yes, yes, absolutely. Once again, you can double check here by quickly using the, double, the dot product. Um, you realize that uh, the dot product of this matrix, uh, this line multiplied by this guy, can will give you, uh, should equal to zero. So apply the dot product really quickly and then you can find that this guy should give you a value of zero. Or even the cross, the cross product, if you take this guy and cross this one, you should get these values. Let me change my pointer, to something that you can see. So yeah, the dot product of this, uh, when you do the dot product, don't forget the zeros, yeah? 
the dot product of this and this must equal to zero, or the, dot, the cross product of this and this will give you this guy. Or another way is to simply check the magnitude again. Uh, 21 or 0.21 square, or dot 0.66 square, 0.72 square should give you uh, zero at the end. Uh, one, excuse me. Uh, square, 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 on the square should give you one again, or 0.999 or something like that. So this is how you can verify the values that you get it uh, over here. Okay, so now let's move on from these features into the final uh, discussion of today, which is the inverse of a frame matrix. And the inverse of a matrix is something that, if you, if you have worked with matrix operations in the past, then you will be like, oh no, not this again, because you know what matrix uh, or what inverse operation or operations is. Because in, in regular matrix operations, man, inverse or developing the inverse is very, very tedious work. Uh, that's why it's um, kind of scary to think about. But the reason why we need sometimes inverse is because uh, obviously to do inverse operations, uh, if you want to go forward, let's say from the joint values to the position to the end effector, you might need forward analysis. So you can use the frame matrix directly. But if you want to go backward, you might have at some point to develop the inverse of the frame matrix. Meaning, if you already have this frame, how is the inverse of it will look like or will be equal to? You would want to have this information. And the significance of the inverse will also be shown in a later time. Okay, let's, so let's now see how we can find the inverse of the frame matrix. Now, good news to us is that this matrix, if you remember, is not a real, not, not an actual matrix, or better words say that this matrix is a compound matrix. So it's not really a four by four matrix, it's a three by three matrix here, and a three by one vector here. And now these guys, they will never change. Zeros and ones, they will never move. So in this way, when we deal with this matrix and you would like to find its inverse, we will also treat the components separately. So you want to find the inverse of the frame matrix. You are really finding the inverse of this components by itself, then the inverse of this component by itself, and then putting them back together yourself. The zeros and ones will not be affected. They will always be there. So how do you find then the inverse of the frame matrix? Let's begin with the easy one, which is the R matrix. The inverse of the R matrix is simply the transpose. If you remember what that means, the transpose really is, um, this is an exercise that you're supposed to do. Uh, it's okay, um, I can do it here. So the transpose really is, you have to imagine a, a, a diagonal line here. And then you'll have to mirror the matrix across this line. So whatever was here, this guy right here will have to go here. And whatever is here, right, will have to take its place, like a mirror, basically. And this guy, oops, what's going on here? Okay, well, and the NZ right here will have to go here. And uh, the AY will have to go here. And whatever is in a diagonal, okay, this became ugly. So, let's so whatever is in a diagonal doesn't move. But whatever is outside the diagonal will move across the diagonal line. So once again, the NZ will go in the place of AX, and the AX will go here. And the OZ will go here, and the AY will go here, but whatever is on the diagonal line will stay there. And that is essentially the meaning of transport, in case you forgot. So this part is easy. The, 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 the transpose or the inverse of the R vector essentially is the inverse. Okay, what about this part right here? Well, this right here essentially, what does it say is the negative of the dot product. This is not a, this is not a dash here, this is a negative sign here. Yeah? The formula really is a negative. You will have to calculate the dot product of n dot p. This vector right here, uh, let me uh, change the color. Is it highlight? Oh, perfect, yes, highlight. So basically, all you have to do is take the n vector, which is these two components, and dot product, the, what happened here? This is uh, worse than before. Yeah, so you take the n vector, and then you multiply it by the p vector, which is uh, this component right here. Okay, Px, Py, and Pz. And how do you do then the dot product? Can somebody remind me of the formula? If you know Nx, Ny, Nz, and Px, Py, Pz, what is the dot product between them? Can somebody quickly say it? Magnitude of N times magnitude of P times cosine P. 
uh, uh, that's if you already have the magnitudes readily available and the angle. But right now, you don't have the magnitudes or the angle between them readily, except instead you have the x, y, z component. So I want the formula that uses the x, y component. Anyone? It's nx px, uh, sorry, nx multiplied by px plus ny py plus nz pz. So let me uh, write this down somewhere. So the dot product, if you have only the x, y component and you don't have angle or the magnitude, essentially it's nx uh, px plus ny py plus nz Z. Okay, and don't forget the negative sign on the outside. So all of that that you see over here, I can, can put a sign here. Maybe. So can I put the negative sign? Okay, negative, negative, negative sign. Okay. So that's what we mean by this part right here. So basically, negative p, yeah, p capital V yeah, dot n equal to this, equal to the the peak, the x component multiplied by the x component, and uh, the y component multiplied by the y component, and the z component multiplied by the z component. You can see here. So px multiplied by nx, py multiplied by ny, and pz multiplied by nz. Whatever, and then you add them together. So this is the, 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 the that's product. Uh, 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 sorry, the, the sum product. So the product of this, product of this, product of this, and then add them all together, and give you a single number, then multiplied by negative one, and that would be the answer that you need. Is that clear? Similarly here, so OP basically means that PX dot product O instead of N, is that right? And over here is the same thing, but instead of O, you go for A. You know what I mean? So that is essentially how you find the dot product for the vector component. You take the P components and the dot product to N. So PX, N, PY, NY, and PZ, NYZ, and then whatever answer you get, uh, multiplied by negative one. And then you put it here. And then you repeat the process for O, you repeat the process for A. Is that clear? Any questions about this uh, definition? Just one particular reminder yeah, that this, uh, this formula here applies to the original matrix before you transpose it, not after. Meaning, when you do the dot product, don't do it here. Uh, let me remove those. Here, you see, if you apply the dot product, if you think I already transposed it, let's apply the dot product here. If you do that, you will multiply px by nx, that would work. And then if you multiply py, you will, apply, you will multiply it by ox. That would give you a wrong formula. You are supposed to multiply ny by py, not, um, I'm sorry, multiply py by ny, not by ox. So when you apply the formula here, you see right here, Make sure you apply it on the original matrix before you transpose the R component. Okay? If all of this is quite difficult or not 100% uh, grasp, no problem. We'll apply the example. So let's go to the next slide and do one example. Right here, uh, let's do it together. Okay? I'll give you a chance to try it on your own and then we do it together. So, first of all, let's find A inverse which is the frame inverse of this matrix right here. You have all numbers you see here. So all of these numbers you see here. So then apply the rules you see right here. Essentially, um, this R matrix part, all you have to do is, is find the transpose. And then over here, you have to do a dot product three times, okay? So based on that, go ahead and do, and begin working on this exercise. Give it a try, jump in the pool, drown for a while, don't worry, and then we'll do it together and hopefully you will kill. So again, uh, somebody already did it. <laughs> Fantastic. Some people, thanks, I mean, good job, uh, Fauzi. Uh, he already did, I'm, I'm looking at this solution. Uh, oh wait, sorry, that's the previous example. So, but also good job, uh, I mean. Uh, go ahead and try this particular exa example, exercise number four. The solution for the mean policy just now was from exercise three, uh, from the previous exercise. So let's go ahead and try this exercise and find the inverse of A minus O of this question. I'll give you a couple of minutes. Uh, I'll, I'll um, mute myself and then we can uh, do it together.
Okay, so I saw one solution in the group and it's a correct one. So that means uh, time to get back to work. Now, whether you finished or not, you should complete it anyway. Uh, some people are faster than others, it's all right. Uh, even if you're slow today and it's not a problem, it's the first time, it's not a problem. The more exercises you do, the better. But for the, the faster you will get. So let's take a look at the solutions. Uh, step number one is the transpose of the rotation matrix. Uh, let me change my marker again. Okay, so right here, this part right here. So all you have to do is to find the transpose, as you can see here. So imagine a diagonal line. So these three values, 0 0.21, 0 0.57, 0 0.11, are not moving. They're the same. You just have to move everything around the diagonal line, as you can see here. So 0.43 goes here, 0.66 goes here, and so on and so forth. So the answer to the rotational part is right here. So far, so good. Okay, next step, the dot product. So I'm gonna go one by one here. The dot product, I'm gonna begin with the first one, which is P dot N. Uh, the dot product are actually are three of them. N dot P, uh, P dot N, N dot P is the same thing. Yeah? Uh, first, I'm gonna show you the N one, right? So the dot product for the N essentially is this vector, dot product, this one, and this original one, not the, the one we already transposed, yeah? This original matrix, yeah? Not this one down here. Not this one, no. We're gonna use this one right here. Uh, let me uh, clean this up a little bit. So let's erase this. So you use the matrix that is involved in the original matrix and not the transposed matrix, okay? So let's get back to... Uh, so this is the dot product between N and P. So 8.6 multiplied by 0.21, which is right here. Basically, Px and X plus Py and Y plus Pz and Z. So Px and X, Py and Y, Pz and Z. And you put them all there and you maintain the sign. Okay, take this sign and put it here. There was a negative sign on the outside, I put it inside. So negative, 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 they're all there, okay? And then this one has a negative also because it's right here. By the way, this is the tricky situation in the dot product. You have to keep track of the negative sign. And you make one mistake, boom, everything is gone. And you have to understand that we're using matrix in order to use it to calculate other things later on. When you find the matrix of, uh, when you find an inverse of, an, of a string, you want to use that inverse to find other things later. So if your inverse itself is wrong, then everything else after that will be wrong. So take your time when you do the dot product, and also take your time to meticulously uh, keep track of the negative sign. So once again, the 0.8 multiplied by these two, uh, negative multiplied by this number, and then there's another negative here, so this will become a plus. So this is on 0.8.3 multiplied 0.7, don't be a negative, so do the math, and you should get this number, okay? So that's negative 4.61. Please verify and check your answers with me. If your answer is different, you might uh, be right, and I might be wrong, so double check the calculations. And if you think you're right, uh, you're right uh, by all means, let me know. Yeah? Uh, you might have a slightly different number because of rounding. Yeah? I stopped at 6.1. You maybe put 6.14, maybe you put 6.2, uh, sorry, 4.62, something like that. But I said, uh, the, for now, I'm not going to punish for the rounding, but let's just discuss the rounding later. Yeah? Let's move on to the next. Uh, this one now is. Uh, and uh, excuse me, the P dot O. And again, I moved the, the visualization to show you which, which vector we're going to multiply. So 8.6 8 multiplied by 4.3, negative 0 0.4 minus 0 0.7, and then 8.3 multiplied by 0 0.70, and then do the math, magic, and then negative 7.6. Uh, I'm seeing people putting different numbers. Make sure that you double check the math. Uh, once again, if you found a different number in the end, that's because you might have missed a negative sign somewhere, okay? I'm looking at someone who put this answer right here as a 0.77. Uh, you, might have, you might have missed a, a negative sign there. So make sure you double check, okay? And the last one is uh, P dot A, once again. Uh, eight, uh, this is P, P, P X A X. Uh, PY, NY, uh, AY, and then PZ, AZ, and once again, pay attention to the negative sign 
and do the math and you should get negative 7.4. Again, rounding up, uh, if you got 741, 739, something like that, it's fine as long as you're in the neighborhood, yeah? So this is the answer. And uh, essentially, uh, this is the, this matrix that you're looking at right now in blue is the inverse of this matrix. Okay, you have a dispute. You don't believe me. You disagree with my numbers and you think that I am wrong and or maybe you work with your friend and you're not sure which one is right, which one is wrong, or who is right and who is wrong. How do you verify your work without having to redo everything all over again? How can you verify your work to make sure that you got the right answer? Can somebody tell me how can we verify the answer? How can I verify that this is indeed the inverse of this matrix? Anyone answers this one and get a bonus point. The third one for today. Going once, bonus uh, point. I uh, guess. Who is that? Can we, yeah. Yeah, can go ahead. we check in in calculator, sir? Type in the matrix. Uh, that means you have to do your work again. Is that right? No. Yes. No, there is another way to do this without having to double or redo your calculations. There is another way to verify your work 100%. Anybody else? Yeah. No? No takers? Yeah, have fun. So, uh, is it uh, if you cross product A and A inverse, you uh, get one? Uh, not cross product, something else. It's the regular multiplication. But you know what? I'll give you the, the, the bonus point anyway. So congratulations. So Irfan gets the third point. I'm in the mood today. The answer is that if you take any matrix and you multiply it regularly, and there's no cross multiplications in, in matrices, and you multiply it by its own inverse, you should get the unit matrix. So if you take X and you multiply it by its own inverse, you should get unit matrix. What's the unit matrix? Matrix with one and zeros. Yes, uh, that's the unit matrix. And uh, I'm gonna show it to you. Uh, sometimes they call it the identity matrix. It's ones and zero, it's zero everywhere except the diagonal. You know what I mean? So the identity matrix or a unit matrix is this. It's ones on the diagonal, zero everywhere else. If you take your matrix, the inverse, and you multiply it by its own frame, you will get the unit matrix. The ones out here and zeros everywhere else. You can test it and try it, and then it will work for you as well. Uh, sir, this will be this will take longer than doing the work again. I understand, and I agree. But the question was another way other than trying again. So, what value is considered to be significant? Okay, good question. Somebody was asking about, I think. Uh, uh, the question from uh, Amin, right? Um, what is considered about, um, I forgot about that, right? Oh, yeah, sorry, there was something else. Okay, let's talk about the, uh, the rounding, yeah? The, the rounding error is a significant issue. Uh, okay, the rounding error, what, when is it significant and when is it not significant? Uh, for me personally, um, I don't have an issue with rounding, even if you round all the way to one decimal, like 0.1. But the significance of rounding is not uh, as in, the, okay, what I'm trying to say is that if you want to present your final answer and you want your answer to look cool, so one decimal is fine with me. So meaning, let's say the answer is, um, the answer you got from the calculator yeah, is 75 or 78 point, uh, okay, no one knows this. this. This is what you got from the calculator. And you want to represent the final answer. So you take all of that and you write uh, 3.4, that would be two. That would be the rounding error. If, uh, if this is a final answer, if this is a final answer, then it's fine. Then it's okay. What do you mean by final answer? Final answer means that this value, 58.2, will not be used to calculate something else. If you're going to take 58.2 to calculate something else, if you will use, if you have to do, or this is called answer, yeah. you use the answer to, to calculate something else, 
then the best answer is that you don't round at all or at least keep three decimals for accuracy. Anything beyond two decimals, then I think it's too accurate already. So three decimals. So that will be three, uh, that will be 58, uh, what is that? 58.3, uh, four, and uh, zero. Uh, yeah, three, four, zero. Yep, yeah, because if you run the one right here, there will be two after it, so it doesn't times to this into zero. So that will be the answer, acceptable answer for rounding, yeah? Uh, if you're going to use the value for later calculations, because uh, this value then, because if you round on one level, and then later on you calculate something, and you round again, and you calculate something, and you round again, this error or this rounding error will build up. And by the time you reach the end, you're gonna give a significant error in the end. If you cannot, or if let's say, if you do not round at all, let's say if you use this, the same number altogether, that's of course is the ideal answer. But of course, if you're doing this by hand, this will be very difficult. But if you are uh, doing it, let's say in Excel or in programming, then whatever value you get, you reuse, don't round. You only really round the final answer and just for demonstration or just for cosmetics reasons only and not for uh, anything else. Is that clear? Um, I mean, and I hope that's clear for everyone else that uh, the importance and the effect of rounding on your final answer. Okay, uh, so the, the short answer is, uh, if it's the final answer, then one decimal is fine, but if you're gonna use it for something else, then three or four decimals is important, or even no rounding whatsoever, if you can, so that you don't have uh, later problems. Okay, any other questions about rounding? I mean, next time, or anyone else, the next time, if you have any questions, please ask uh, using audio. Just unmute yourself and ask, because I might not notice your question. Okay, let's move on now. So now that you are, it's over. <laughs> okay, so the inverse, or calculating the inverse was the last thing we have for today. And uh, essentially, um, um, the significance why the, uh, the inverse was at the end is because we will use it a lot when we do later operations, especially when, when we do something called uh, de decoupling, which will come in about one month from now. Okay, I think we are done for the content of today. We spend a lot of time on inverse operations. I will open the floor if you have any questions regarding anything we discussed today. If you have any questions regarding the content of today uh, or the slides, let's recap. We talked about in kinematics in general, we talked about uh, robot kinematics. Then we talked about um, um, some lecture are really strict about decimal points. Um, I agree, and I think they are strict because, oh, you mean also for this for present, for presentation. Maybe they want to teach you the habit of being careful with, with rounding. For me, I'm uh, okay with it if it's just for presentational uh, reasons. But if you just to be just, just to be careful with calculations. Okay, let's get back to our point here. So um, yeah, let's recap what we covered today. Uh, kinematics in general, robot kinematics, forward and inverse. We talked about the frame matrix. We talked about um, we discussed uh, the construction of the frame matrix, and we talked about um, um, things like um, point, line, a frame, and we also talked about uh, the properties of the frame matrix, such as um, the magnitude, the cross product, the dot product, et cetera, et cetera. And also we talked about a very significant element of the frame matrix, which is the concept of the inverse and how do we find the inverse. Uh, and then uh, we did one exercise on the inverse. So, uh, so I hope you benefited from today. Don't worry, we're not gonna do another chapter. I just wanna briefly give you a preview of the next chapter, which is gonna be on transformation. Uh, by the way, I, I hope you guys noticed how and when I give bonus points. It's usually, uh, if you look at the slides, you will see it's around the places where I have verify or why, or I'm going to try to find these questions somewhere here, right? Like whenever you go through the slides, you will see some places where I add how or verify or why or, or this thing like this right here. So if you want to, uh, like this right here, you know what I mean? So if you want to prepare next week for the next session, I suggest that you go through the slides ahead of me for two reasons. 
Number one reason is that you will be prepared for the questions and for the exercises. Secondly, and more importantly, you already know the bonus point questions ahead of time. So this way you will be prepared for them. And then when the, when the time comes, you'll be the first person to get it. So this is an opportunity for you to plan ahead and therefore get the bonus points. Now, next week we will be talking about, um, now that we talked about frames, we'll be talking about transformations next week. What is the transformation matrix, which is the second part? Uh, we know the frame matrix, now we're gonna talk about the, the transformation matrix. We talk about rotary and linear transformations, and then we talk about global and local coordinates and graphical base coordinates and symbolic averages. So that will be the discussion for next week. Uh, this week, uh, there's a lot of theory involved because this is the beginning, but starting from next week, there will be a lot more work to do, as you can see here. Uh, I can tell you right now that this part right here is on its own eight exercises, eight, not two or three, eight on its own, this part alone, yeah? So um, I suggest strongly that you go through ahead of me and prepare. And as you will know already that all of these slides, all of them are already on Moodle, as you can see here, but minus the solutions. The solution I keep it for myself and we will discuss during the, the actual lecture. Okay, if you're watching this on YouTube, apologies, this course has been done, but you can go ahead and attempt uh, questions and the answers on your own. And of course, you can have bonus points. Okay, so any questions uh, for anyone in the class today? Sir, mm -hmm. uh, will you upload the notes that you presented today in the Moodle? You mean, you mean the, the solutions? The solutions? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, let me ask the floor. Do you guys want it? The rest of the team, the rest of the gang? Show of hands, yeah, show of hands. Raise your hand if you want me to pause, uh, post the solution version or the, the, the one with the solutions for your reference. Yes, sir, uh, why not? Okay. Okay, but I will not do it right now. I want to give you, I want you to have some time to practice and try and suffer first. If you're going to read the solution and automatically, uh, without having tried, you will not learn. So I suggest give it a couple of days first, try, and then I will post it in a couple of days' time. Okay, if I don't, please remind me. Huh? Maybe by uh, today's Monday, probably by Wednesday or Thursday, I will do so. Okay, thank you so much, sir. You're welcome. Anybody else? Any other questions? Well, I guess this is it. We don't have to wait until seven o'clock so we can actually end the session now. Uh, wait, um, so those who are doing or working on a C++ assignment, the, the, you know, the, the, those who, by the way, who, who have no problem doing the C++ assignment, you can leave now. The session is over. In fact, I'm going to stop the recording right now. Thank you very much, guys. And I'm going to stop the recording now.